G'day and welcome to Torment Thursdays. Last time round, well, basically I've gotten a bit st stuck and right now I'm just kind of trying to work out what on earth I can do. So hopefully I haven't done something dumb and um, failed to save the last time around. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is now ordered by date, so better not have. Uh, and the goal here is just to try and figure out what the heck I can do. Everything seems to have led to a dead end. So I did other things like get engaged in a martial arts fight because that's the kind of thing you want to do, right? Um, what did I... because I completed something last time. Uh, no? As of the adversary, yeah, I dealt with that. No, whatever I did last time didn't count as a uh, quest. Okay, fine. Um, I fought a martial artist. That was what I did. That's what I remember doing. So, now the next step is to, I don't know, try and deal with stuff down here. The mapper is useless. That's what I remember. But maybe I can get something with Mikella. Welcome back. Want to buy anything? Let me know. Um, tell me again where you get your stock. I trade for it. That's what traders do. Okay, well yeah, that was pretty useless. Um, so she's got a thing for hiding and a pretty good ranged weapon. Um, but none of these are things that I want. I could sell some stuff off, but no, I don't think that's what I want to do. Okay, the map was useless. Uh, Queek. We'll, we'll talk to Queek and possibly Varanoth. So she dies if we rest and haven't resolved that story. A small hollow cheeked mutant sings a soft, wavering tune to herself. Yellow bruises discolor her skin and uh, wounded formed not from violence but from mal malnutrition. Her prominent bones bend and twist at odd angles. Still, she smiles. Smiles at the oily water devoid of any fish. She smiles as she arranges her empty basket beside her. She smiles at you when she sees you standing over her. Hello, I'm Crooked Creek of the Cold Canyon Tribe. I haven't seen you down here before. I hope you're not here to fish. They're, they're nibbling instead of biting today. She coughs into her cupped hands. A raw and ragged hacking that bends her double. You take her for a child at first, but after studying her features, it's clear she's in her late teens. Only some mutation and her bony structure, born of starvation, um, is what makes her seem childlike. Do you know where I might find a woman named Matkina? Matkina? She's, yes, that's not what people call her. She leans towards you, eyes around us going, they call her White Death. She says, she's an assassin. I don't know where she is, and I hope I never do. Why are you scared of her? They say... They say she can freeze your blood by speaking her name. And if you look her in the eyes, all her hair will turn white. You don't really believe those stories about her, do you? No. She blushes. No, but she is a killer, and I... I have a soft spot for scary stories. You said you're part of the Cold Canyon tribe. Are they down here too? No, she says lightly. They're all gone. Either dead or gone. She still isn't meeting her eyes. There used to be a lot of us. We came here when I was a baby, running from... A war? Some sort of war that never ends. My parents thought we would be safe here, but the tribe died off one by one. This city's hard on people like us. How's the city hard on your tribe? They were used to living in the wilderness, so they knew what they could eat safely. Here it's not so simple. My mother told me ten people died eating tainted food before we found this fishing hole. She stares into the murky water. Then there's the, the diseases you can catch in the city, and the hate. A lot of us were killed just for being hard to look at, I guess. That's actually a fair point, because in a kind of more medieval setup, um, cities are way more dangerous in the countryside. Um, here it's a bit different, because there are literal monsters that can kind of inhabit the the countryside as well but like disease was way more rife in cities 
un, you know, I'm not exactly a uh, detailed student of history, so I could be wrong there, but that's my understanding. Is it as hard for you to survive here as it was for your people? No, she says, smiling. I don't have to eat a lot, and I'm more resistant to sickness than my parents were. And people here know me. They leave me alone. Said everyone in your tribe is dead? Not everyone, she says with a brave smile. I'm here, and some of us just left better places. I bet they're doing really well. Your real name is Crooked Quick? Sort of. My parents called me Quick, but the nickname came later. She hunches over, her eyes darting shadily from side to side. It's because I sell junk for high prices and bribe the levies to carry people off in the night. She laughs. No, not really. People call me Crooked because I look twisted and broken. Don't you mind that people call you that? Not really. I can't call them lies, can I? She smiles, but it's not the radiant thing you saw before. Why do you say the fish aren't biting? The fish down here are pretty smart, fast and smart. They're nibbling at the bait and swimming away. She watches the line in, with a combination of hunger and weariness. It's hard for me to get to the pole in time when the rod twitches, and harder to reel in the catch. I'm not very strong. Can I try fishing with your gear? You're welcome to it. Only, if you do find something, could you share... She trails up blushing. Never mind, company's better than a scrawny fish. Farewell. Alright, let's do a spot of fishing. Come back, anytime. Spot o fishing. This thin glowing thread pierces the surface of the water and plunges deep into the black depths like a white line drawn in shining ink. Examine the line. You try flicking the shining string and your finger goes straight through it. Could you try catching something for me? I've had no luck today. Besides, everything down there is pretty much stronger than me. Try catching something for her. You pull on the line and something in the dark below pulls back. You press your lips together and reel in your catch. A muddy cipher dangles from the end of the line. It's beautiful. I was just hoping for a fish. I can sell it and eat for weeks. Yeah, let's give it to her. You pass the cipher to her. She squinches her eyes shut in unmitigated joy. Thank you. Use my fishing pole whenever you want. Let's tug on the line. And nothing. And again, we might have better luck tomorrow. I suspect is the answer. So if we sleep, we may get that. And gold is charity, right? Now if we chat to her. What's new? Uh, nope. I can't ask her about Makina again. Which is a pity. Okay. These are... Oh, this is Allegon's stuff. Mantpa? Let's try this. Maybe he can help us. This lissom Jack looks down on his luck, judging from his bare feet and dusty jerkin, but he takes in his surroundings with a hopeful gaze. As you approach, he smiles and throws out his arms in greeting, which reveals the tools of his trade on his belt. He puts a finger on the side of his nose and gives you a wink. Ow now, help me. Got any vert plod for a topside slipper? Uh, possibly? Sunshine! Sea slide to landward! Both? He grins at a steady plod, then that's sunshine! I'll just need a sniffer for the landward, but you'll have to find me a dangler for the slide, you catch me? Catch you? He gives you a suspicious look. You don't speak the count at all, do you? What were you leading me on for? I wanted to see how far I could go. My he shakes his head with a grin. Not far enough, I'm afraid, but no worries. Should have spotted you for a sit the moment I saw you. Never mind. He claps his hands and gives you a fresh once over. So, new to the underbelly, eh? Just visiting or looking for something in particular? Who are you? Mantpa, professional fenestrationist. Recently arrived in the big city from Fair Kyokirin uh, and at Yale's service. Where is Kyokirin? What? You've never heard the old song? Do you know the way to cure Kirin? He starts singing, In the back of the back, in the back of beyond, east of the spire and west of the run. That's where the girls are footless and free. That's where my sweetheart is waiting for me. No? Not one of your favorites? Ah, well. What's a fenestrationist? Oh, well, I open windows for a living. Okay. What can you tell me about this place? What can I... What can you tell me about the shins in your purse? Have you got a few to spare? I'm skinny at the moment, and it's making it hard to remember things. Fine, here's three. 
He snatches the coins and they disappear into his record chest. Much obliged. He rubs his beard listening. Where to start? You want to hear about the people who live here? Or maybe the stitcher tunnels? Or the manufactory? Or those crazy dendro her bastards? Or maybe you heard about the murder and you're looking for a thrill? Um, so let's go with... Give me a general take on the underbelly. It's the bottom of the ladder. As they say around here, there ain't no more down to go. But that's a good thing, right? It means you've got nowhere to go but up. A passing thought dims his cheering expression. Unless you drown or get swallowed by the bloom or something. Yeah, I would actually say the bloom is probably more down than here. Uh, tell me about the people here. He blows out his cheeks. Hmm, well, I won't talk about everyone. There's a lot of us here, but I'll hit the highlights. Or lowlights, I guess. There's Fulsum, of course. He runs things around here. Not officially, mind you. He's just the sharpest dragon with the hardest screw is all. Michaela, who sells bits and bobs at a stall. Mook, the meatmonger, who sells, uh, meat. Uh, tell me I sent you if you pay him a visit. He gives me a shin for each referral. Uh, let's see, there's Aligon, the Aeon Priest, who- Oh, there you are, Aligon. I was just about to say wonderful things about you. I'll bet. Go on. Uh, there, uh, sure, then there's Mappa, crazy cock who's covered in maps, and well, uh, I suppose what's- That's it, what with Crooked Creek dead. Hey, she's not dead yet. He's supposed to sense. Yep, that's all that's- Worth mentioning. That's really suspicious and or a bug. Um, she's not dead yet. Hey. Uh, what do you know about the Stitcher Tunnels? They've dug them all over the place around here. Can only see the ends of them since they fill them with loose dirt that only they can dig through. Uh, what about the manufactory? Uh, it's a hard blood right there, folks. You'd think we're smart enough to know honest work's bad for you, slaving away at those furnaces, and giant constructs watching over them like metal slave drivers. I only looked in once, scared the wits out of me, so I never went back. Um, tell me more about the Dendro Ha. Huh? Well, uh, the cannibals? Ha! Huh. I think, sometimes I think they do it just so they can be crazier than anyone else. I know they got some kind of mumbo jumbo reason for eating dead folks, but I think they just like making people squirm, you know? You know anything about the murder of Folsom's protege? Now that is some spooky effluvium, and no mistake. Circle of blood on the wall, but all they found of the Vic was a skinless hand. Happened in the alcove on the other side of the structure if you want to see it. I was hoping you'd give me something useful, but fine. What can I find? Uh, the White Death? Ooh, you ain't crazy, are you? He lifts his hands placatingly. Sorry, sorry, none of my business. Couldn't tell you where she is, but you might want to try talking to the mapper. He's squatting in one of the shanties down here. If there's any place she can hide, he'd know about it. I already talked to mapper. He wants me to find a hidden sanctuary of the changing god first. Thank goodness, at least I can tell someone that. Is that so? A spot even old mapper knows nothing about. Who would have thought? What you might want to do is jump up to that stitch over there. I know who talked to a Stitcher, but I got a feeling they're smarter than anyone else says. Yes, but the Stitcher won't take me there. And, I, like, even when I was chummy with the Stitcher. Ha! Ah, mm, that told me nothing. That was a kind of pleasant conversation, but it told me nothing I didn't already know! And there's a headless man who says nothing. That's probably fair enough. Um. Uh, ba -ba. What if... Is there anyone here I can chat with? Nah. No one I care to chat to. I could talk to this guy. Maybe he would help. I'm not sure if I have this playthrough. But I don't think it'll get me anywhere. Michaela got me nowhere. Mappa. What if I talk to the Mapper again? Um, can you tell me where I should start looking to find the Changing God Sanctuary? <sighs> That's a good question, friend. A good question. If I knew, I wouldn't be asking you, eh? All I know is it's an avoid beneath the city. You know how cities build and build upon themselves? It's like that. Do you know... Do you know of a place where the rock is hard and full of energies of prior worlds? The kind of stitch you like to dig. Hmm... 
Was that supposed to be a challenge? Not far from Sega, a big old spire of black rock glimmers and shines, but only under starlight. Seems to be balanced precariously on the cliffside. It drives deep down to the earth. Stitcher should find out a deal. Frankly, not sure why they're in the suit in the first place, unless they're just being lazy. Spire's a much better spot for their kind. Um... Yeah, okay. Actually, that seems pretty useful. Um, maybe I can use that. Is there anything I can do over here more? Um, we've got the hand, and it's just a skinned hand, the, the fingers have curled slightly, and there's still a meaningless arrangement. Um, do we want to talk to Varanoth, or do we want to actually head over and try and use that information with stitches? Maybe we'll do that one. Let's just talk to Keck. Chikek regards you silently, then begins its pantomime. The scent of tunnel grubs and sharp metal fills the air. Uh, I've come to ask you to stop digging underneath the city. Why? No. I can't. Nope. What about anything else? Nope. Nope. Nothing new. Nothing new. Basically, I... Can you take me someplace under the city? Nope. There's just, like, I need to learn the language. To learn the language, I've got to, I guess, boost somewhat. Um, okay. So, and I haven't been able to bring up the murder with anyone. All right. So there's a couple of things I can do then. I can go and try and finish that quest. I can talk to Varanoth and see if she gets me anywhere. This large and heavily muscled woman wears what appears to be rags that should have fallen apart ages ago. She looks so tired that it wouldn't be so surprised if she fell asleep on her feet. And yet when she opens her mouth her voice is energetic like a little girl who just got to get a present. Hello, can anyone hear what I'm saying? Ah, I can't make I can't make, make this work. Without warning, she wheels around and punches a crate on the wall. Oh, oh no, I hope I saw no one saw that. Who are you? Are you talking to me? Her head swivels awkwardly around, trying to catch a glimpse of you. Oh, you are! My name is Varanoth, Champion of the Wastes! The woman flinches at the sound of a very different booming voice that comes out of her own mouth. That's not my name, you stupid thing. It's Varanoth, Champion of the Wastes! Damn, I come from a land you've never heard of! Damn it, I guess I'm not allowed to say. So, you aren't fair enough, Champion of the Wastes? I'm not, but you might as well call me that. Oh, just fair enough. One shoulder shrugs and keeps shrugging. Actually, I'm not actually here. I'm just talking through her and trying to move her around. Her shoulder freezes mid shrug. It keeps yelling over me if I talk about something I'm not supposed to, she says, long of us. But maybe if I speak carefully. The chin chops her chest. My family explores the world using special tools. The body stabs itself with its finger pointedly. But they tell me I'm too young to help. So I waited until everyone was sleeping and, you know, the head lolls back on its neck, winking at the roof of the cabin. Are you an explorer too? I am, but not like you. Oh, oh, she says for some reason. Uh... So she says, for some reason I thought you were champion of the wastes too. Damn it. Did it again, didn't it? Just don't tell anyone don't tell anyone I can. Alright? Ah, well, I am, alright. What can that construct do? Well, it's really hard to break. My mother, who usually controls it, once got it stepped on by an adult earth shaker. Just stuck her on the ground like a nail. The woman flexes a bicep. Am I flexing? The girl says, I'm trying to flex. Anyway, it's also incredibly strong. Punch holes in mountain strong. The arm flops back to her hip. And it's not really a construct. There's no metal inside. She has blood, bones, perfect human expressions. Not that you can tell from how I do it. Uh, the girl adds sourly. The woman's face grimaces along with her. Where did you get the construct? I was born in a storm on a battlefield at night, the woman roars. Huh. The girl says after a respectful silence, she really doesn't want me to tell you what I just tried to tell you. Why do you people explore? Our impenetrable fortress in a lost valley is falling apart. I think we should just go out into the world for real, but my family's afraid. 
The finger on the woman's right hand wriggles like they're playing an instrument. Her dead expression doesn't change, as in, even as the voices, uh, the girl's voice rises. I know, of course, but they won't even let me use this thing. I have to sneak around like a child. Uh, who are you again? <laughs> I'm Varanoth, champion of the wastes. The old woman bellows. Sorry, I tried to say my real name again. Okay, I mean <laughs> that's really cool flavor. And I just kind of assume that we will eventually go to one of the, to the, to wherever uh, that girl is actually based out of. But why can't I bring up the murder anywhere? All right, so there is a quest I can complete. Now I'm thinking about it, I can do the. Um, I can go chat about the um, what's it? Purple levy kept thinking privy and it's definitely not privy so I'll go talk about the levy that's acting up and that will sort us out for that uh, and then we can move on to something else I don't know just like really not sure what I'm meant to be doing with a bunch of these things uh, who is this person Alkin Perry oh, we could do this area we'll do that next time this woman appears to be absorbed by what she's doing. Her blue eyes narrowed in concentration. You realize she's the nicest looking person you've seen in a while and feel almost compelled to approach her. She shakes out the golden cloth she is examining and holds it up to the light. Such beautiful colors, she murmurs. She meets your gaze. It would look lovely on you. In fact, she leans back for a moment and looks you up and down pensively. She nods once to herself as if pleased. As I thought, not a touch of a miserly nature in you. She offers you a sweet, shy smile. We're going to get along just fine. Hmm. So I think that was actually using our title affinity. Can you tell me about this place? Of course, this is Government Square, home to the City Council and the Order of Truth. The rest is embassies and city records, but you might enjoy a stop at the Red Thicket. She points to the red in uh, stone enclosure nearby. Uh, she smiles at you briefly. Oh, you might not. It's a place where secrets are traded. And having a few secrets of my own, I make a poor visitor. Um, who are you? My name is Alton Perry. You can call me Alton, if you like. She offers a tentative smile. I'm a geogen, but I work mostly with children. You know, healing scraped knees and the occasional broken bone. We're lucky here in Segus that it's rarely anything more serious. What are you doing? Waiting for an appointment, she says with a tentative smile. Oh well. Take care. Okay, so let me check something. Ah. Uh, because we've gotten, yeah, we're currently gold attuned. But, uh, so yeah, that's actually our title affinity. Um, what else? What we want to do is we want to go up here and we want to chat to this lady. Sigan. This woman is dressed much like the levies who flank her, but unlike them, her expression is sober and alert. Her hair is cut short and the corner of her eyes wrinkled with crow's feet. A little swarm of mechanical drones circles around her, buzzing messages in her ears. She whispers replies in return, and every so often, one of them whisks away, disappearing into the city. What is it, citizen? She pauses, eyes darting to your tattoo. No, you're the one they call it, Don. I heard you were in the city. I sense a sudden wariness in her. It's been ten years since your last visit. I was too young to know you now, but the drones remember. Ten years ago? You couldn't have been a child. You're not that young. I'm younger than I look. Not like you. The years don't touch you, do they? If you don't tell, mind telling me, what's your business in the city? I'm looking for a woman named Malkina. The White Death. Her expression goes flat, but her eyes flick your tattoo again. I should have guessed that. If Matkina is all you want, you should ask for her in the underbelly. It's the last place any of my drones saw her, and the levies don't venture here, there. She leans a little closer and lowers her voice. And if you leave the city afterwards, I'd be very happy if you took her with you. Another drone swoops past and stops just short of the woman's head. It unleashes a series of raspy buzzes and squawks. She whispers something to it and then glances in her direction. What was it you wanted? As she turns her face back from the drone, something about her profile strikes you as familiar. In that moment, she looks much like the ghostly girl you met in the fifth eye, that they could be the same person, that this woman seems 20 years older, at least. 
You look a lot like someone... Let's go with... You don't like Medkina? I don't like assassins, especially good ones. They don't like the temptation. They represent people in power to the people I'm supposed to serve. They make it too easy to solve problems discreetly. You look a lot like someone I met in the fifth eye. She laughs aloud. In that moment, her voice is clear and rich, much like that of a younger woman or even a teenage girl. Was she a scarred peltist, wedded to her blade and fresh from the endless battle? Um, actually, she... <laughs> never seen you laugh before. Actually, she was young, with a chorus of whispering voices all around her. Her face goes pale. Then I know who she was. She was the one who haunted me when I was a girl, the woman I was supposed to become. For as long as I remember, it felt as though this other woman was taking shape inside me. When I was a girl, I'd gaze myself at myself in the looking glass, and every day I seemed less like me and more like her. I don't remember when I abandoned my family, but it couldn't have been more than 10 or 12. They seemed like strangers to me. I couldn't even remember who they were. I started hearing stories about other girls like me, older girls, younger girls. I sought them out and learned everything I could. All the ones I met went mad. They never survived part the 20th year. It wasn't always the same death. Sometimes it was sickness or an accident, or they ended their own lives. But somehow they always died. It was fate, and it was mine too. But you survived. I cheated. When I was old enough to become a citizen, to sacrifice a year to create a levy, I went straight to the Order of Truth and told them I wanted to donate as many years as I could. I didn't think it would work, but what choice did I have? When they started taking the first few years, I aged closer to 20. Each time I thought I'd die. And the last levy that was born for my 20th year, it was a monster. They tried to make me stop, but I refused. I made them go on. I burned through my 20s and beyond. With each year I lost, I felt that other woman inside me, weakening, pleading, dying. I laughed as I burned the years away. When I walked into the Order of Truth, I was a teenage girl. When I walked out a few hours later, I was a middle-aged woman, but I was free. You said the levy born from your 20th year was a monster? It was death. Not death the way it's personified in stories, but death like it really is. A bloated thing with festering sores, vomiting blood, a pile of um, pus and excrement from every orifice. Even the Yeo priests were terrified. They burned it to a pile of ash. How long has this been happening to women in the city? Centuries, I think. The earliest reference I could find was sometime around Chila, but it probably goes back even further. There was an Aeon priest about 80 years ago, thought he'd make his name for himself by discovering the claws. He found out it only affects women in Sagus, never the outlying villages. He thought it might be some kind of Numenera under the city that did it, but he was never, never able to prove anything. So how old are you really? 22. That's why I was too young to remember you when you were la here last. I was a 12 year old girl, a runaway, half mad, and living in the streets. Let's talk about something more positive. Um, what were you saying to the- who are you? I'm glad I told someone. It's easy to tell a stranger such things, perhaps. I'm Sigan, captain of the levies. Not a levy myself, but I command them. What are levies? She points at the purple men. Uh... Soldiers in the council service, they keep order in the city. Her lips purse briefly, but she continues. Every citizen is required to raise a levy for the city's defense. The price is a year of their lives. Do just levies keep every district safe? No. Underbelly lives by its own law. Cliff's, ledge lives, uh, Cliff's Edge lives under no laws at all. If underbellies don't keep order in the, the area, yeah, yeah. Fulsome. Why don't you send them to the Cliff's Edge? A lot of homes have been collapsing, and the city hasn't been able to help. The council believes that the presence of levies could incite them to violence. How are levies raised? Uh, anyone who lives in the city can become a citizen at 16 years of age, or equivalent if they're not human. It's only one requirement. They step into a machine at the Order of Truth, and it takes away a year of the citizens' lives. It take uses that year to create a levy. That one year is all the levy gets. When it's over, they die. I like that, yeah, she lowers her voice for that last bit to kind of avoid the levies dwelling on that fact. Levies seem awfully happy. A smile and a pleasant demeanor could have a hundred explanations, but yet this whole city is fooled by him. I know the levies better than anyone, so the truth is blamed to me. I'd they'll be lying if I claim to understand them. You sure they're not happy? 
They only seem so. They're not. I have other questions. What are you saying to those drones? They carry my orders to levies all over the city. They bring me reports from the levies back to me. A few years ago, the Aeon priests found them buried under life and brought them to life. I learned their language, so our conversations are safe from prying ears. Uh, what's in the building behind you? How is it you don't recognize the seat of government? I know you lived here for a long time. To focus on my studies, I guess. Sounds like something an Aeon priest would say, but that's savvier than they pretend to be. Some of them, anyway. Council meets in here, represented from every slave family and from some of the guilds, depending on who's in favor. Hardly anyone goes in through the doors, though they're just a formality. Most other people have other ways of getting in and out. Um, I've never seen a building like this one before. What is it? They say it's a ship built by the ancients to sail the void between worlds. Now the crag grips it tight like an old husband holds his wife, and it'll never sail free again. I met a cliff, a levy in Cliff's Edge, the stalking man called Finzen. It wants an extra year of his life. It wants what? Her eyes widen in alarm. She whispers something to her circling drums. Sometimes levies go wrong. They could take a bad year from a citizen and turn out flawed. We never let them live when they get like that. You've seen the little talismans they carry? The symbol of the year that made them? If a year is bad enough, they become the talisman shaped in flesh. Monsters that hide in the city and try to bring about the horrors that would have been. You can tell Finn's in his safe. I've sent in a squad to bring in the levy. He'll never see it again. Farewell. Alright, let's go hand in that quest. And then I uh, will call it for this episode. Next time around, we'll head back to Government Square and chat in the place where you cannot be overheard. Which is that red marble place. It's pretty funky. And as long as we don't know what we're doing and any of the quests that we've got, we might as well kind of see what we can actually get done. You know what? In fact, we'll hand in the quest next time. Until then, have a great day. Bye.